some of the um, uh, the basics, uh, the science behind it, and where we are right now. Organ preservation is now a big deal in transplantation research and uh, the business of transplantation. And now that uh, you know the new machines have come, and it's um, it's big business actually for a lot of uh, companies, and there's a lot of work going on uh, sponsored by these companies. Um, <coughs> So, uh, so what is organ pres preservation and why? Uh, organ preservation simply is putting the organ in a state where it can uh, remain viable until it is transplanted into the patient. And it also allows, allows time for the preparation of the recipient, organizing the logistics of retrieval uh, and transportation and laboratory testing. And it's been considered as the supply line for organ transplantation. Now, um, when we look at the history of organ preservation, uh, it's even though there's, there's been a lot of work on, uh, um, uh, in the lab, particularly by, um, uh, uh, by Alexis Carroll, preserving organs, small organs, uh, outside the body for days together, uh, the first transplant, the first successful clinical transplant, which was a homo transplantation between identical twins, they did not use any organ preservation. The kidney was taken out from the donor. Three minutes later, the implantation was started in the recipient. The total time of ischemia was one hour, 22 minutes. And actually, this was how most of the early transplants were done. Nothing actually was done to preserve these organs because theater was the next door, and uh, they were all living donor kidneys. Now, as uh, transplantation became more and more successful, it uh, started having problems because the kidneys would not work. And uh, especially when s once it started having uh, uh, cadaveric transplants, a lot of these organs would not work or will take a long time to work. And the reason. Uh, is what is called the ischemia reperfusion injury, where you take the kidney out from, from the, take an organ out from the body, there's loss of blood supply, and th then you, it starts a, a chain of events within the organ, within the cells of the organ, which make the cells non-viable. So these include, the first thing obviously is the blood supply is cut off, there's no more oxygen, there's no more nutrients, uh, the normal anaer aerobic respiration stops, and uh, anaerobic met 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 metabolism uh, sets in, so that's gl just glycolysis. Uh, there is increasing acidosis in the cell because of accumulation of uh, acid uh, byproducts. There is loss of ATP production. So the, the, the main thing that keeps the cell in its shape is, uh, we know that the sodium potassium ATP is pump. And that keeps pumping sodium out of the cells so that the cell remains uh, in, the, in, the size, in the size it needs to be. Once the pump fails, sodium starts leaking in, the, along with the water gets, gets in, the cells get swollen up and then the injury starts. Along with this, there is uh, um, in increased accumulation of, uh, of uh, um, reactor oxygen species because of, uh, of, of the metabolites which are accumulating the cells. The problem get actually gets worsened when, you, uh, when the uh, oxygen, uh, organ gets reperfused. When the organ gets reperfused, there's a sudden inflow of oxygen to the organ and uh, that actually accentuates the production of uh, free radicals, causing a lot of injury. There's also what is called a no reef phenomenon. So once the organ is out of the body, the, the microvascular shuts down. So you, when you reperfuse the organ, a lot of the blood vessels don't actually uh, uh, open up to get the blood in. So the organ gets warmed, but uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the tissues don't get the oxygen. So because of which there's continuing ongoing warm ischemia. So this combination of ischemia and reperfusion injury leads to a lot of organ injuries and can cause a lot of uh, uh, graft failures. Now, uh, so how do we uh, st uh, counter this ischemic reperfusion injury? We need to reduce the metabolic activity of the cell, so the production of these metabolites is decreased. We need to reduce cellular swelling. Uh, we need to minimize mitochondrial injury, and we need to, again, reduce the reactive oxygen species. And we, at the same time, we need to try and maintain at least a little bit of aerobic respiration so that at least the pumps work. The, the, uh, the cells don't need to repair, don't need to regenerate, but at least if the cells, the pumps work, the morphology of the cells is maintained. And then we need to maintain the integrity microcirculation so your reflow phenomenon doesn't happen. So the, the vascular network is open when the reperfusion starts. Now, um, so this was a report by Thomas Tarzel. Uh, now, this was almost uh, eight years after the first uh, kidney transplantation with the identical twins was done. But actually, this report is interesting not because it was another report of identical twin transplantation, but because of the issues that Stasel discusses in the discussion part. So, you know, he says that the most of these transplants, uh, the, uh, the, the success is related to the ischemia time. 
Uh, and then th they, he also mentions what all steps they took to try and minimize the risk of injury. So maximum speed of reconstitution, so a fast res reconstruction. They actually subject the donor patient to moderate hypothermia so that the organ remains cool to decrease injury. And most importantly, the donor was actually given a dose of heparin just before the organ was clamped and taken out to prevent clotting in the blood. So these are all very important principles. You know, for us, it's very, very logical now. We think, OK, what's the big deal in this? But at that point, probably he was the first person who actually looked at all the previous literature of all the case reports of homotransplant and then picked out things which worked in each, each case and then combined all of them together to come up with a, a logical way of preserving these organs for a significant amount of time. And when you look at the first uh, liver transplantation series by Stasel, again, he talks about how these organs were preserved. Now, these were all cadaveric organs. And at that time, it was only DCD. So that's patient's heart stops. They do a fast retrieval, take the liver out. And the organs were preserved with a, with a variety of things. So they had hypothermia. They used hyper, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, oxygenation of the chamber in which the, oxygen, the organ was preserved. They actually had low flow perfusion of both the portal vein and the arterial system with diluted blood. So all the things that we are now talking about and doing trials in the last five to 10 years, that was done in 1967 in when initial liver transplantation started. Now, the reason why organ preservation and uh, organ uh, uh, um, perfusion for transplantation actually stopped was because of, partly because of this uh, gentleman, Dr. Belzer, he was a surgeon. Um, he started working on kidney preservation and he wanted to improve it. So he started, he developed what is called a, 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 a machine cold perfusion pump and he used cryopreserved plasma as a, a pumping solution. And this was the initial machine. And you can see how big it, they, they used to load it in a truck and take it to the donor hospital, take the kidneys out, put it on the pump, and then bring it back to the hospital. Obviously, over time, they, um, they, the thing was modified. And in fact, it became quite small. And in fact, uh, in, his, uh, in his story, he talks about how he took one kidney, which could not be matched in the US, took it to the Netherlands on this, on this machine, on a jet, and then transplanted it to one of his friend's patients. And obviously, the patient did well. So, but this was how this was the future of organ transplantation in 1965. You know, small machines for pumping organs. Then Jeffrey Collins, a surgeon, he came up with the with a much more simpler radical idea of just flushing the kidney with some solution, just crystalloid solution, with a compos composition which was actually very similar to intracellular fluid. He said, if you flush these kidneys and just put them in the in the kidneys and put it nice the kidney can last for 12 hours. And that immediately shut shop for all these machines. And you know now it's this. You just put the kidney, you flush it, put it in a nice box, and then carry it around, whether it's the kidney or the liver. So that's how organ preservation is now for us. Uh, obviously, Dr. Belzer didn't want to be left behind. So he said, fine, if he's developed a column solution, I want to do something better. So he got together with uh, Dr. Southard in at Winsco Wisconsin and developed the UW solution, which is now the standard of care for uh, static cold storage for almost all organs, kidney, pancreas, uh, livers, uh, and small bowel. And the, the way they went about uh, preparing the solution was basically look at various ways in which cells are getting injured. So they had something to prevent intracellular edema. They had something to maintain the pH, a buffer to maintain the prevent acidosis. They had um, uh, something to reduce oxidative damage. So all of these things together completely change the way organs get preserved. Uh, in fact, he talks about uh, a presentation that he did. And the one slide that uh, caught the attention was uh, a photograph of Stasel sitting in a Learjet after doing a retrieval and trying to get some sleep before he goes and transplant. And Bell's sleeping at his home in his own bed because he can do the transplant next day because it's a new W solution. So, you know, that show that made that completely changed transplantation from an emergency procedure where you run around getting organs and transplant in the middle of the night to doing it in the morning, the next day. And that was followed by a lot of new solutions. I mean, uh, at, there was a period of time when there was a new solution coming up every two, three years. Um, and you know, each of them would be compared against UW and say it is as good as UW or maybe slightly better than UW. Uh, but UW still remains the standard of preservation right now. The problem is that is that 
transplantation became such a straightforward operation that it became very successful. And as it became successful, it had its own problems. So if you look at this graph, this is the waiting list which has been increasing since transplantation became a regular aspect. And this is the number of transplants. There's hardly any increase as compared to the waiting list. The second thing is a lot of these organs are never, never get used because there's some problem. The surgeons are not happy with the perfusion. The surgeons are not happy with the quality of the liver or the kidney. Uh, and also we're seeing that the population is aging, the donor population is aging. So the donors who are all 20, 25 year olds who used to die in road traffic accidents, now they're all 50, 60 year old patients who have a CVA. So the quality of organs hence is going to come down. Uh, there have been various ways to try and improve static cold storage. Now this is a two layer method. This is what uh, for some time it was the standard of uh, care in pancreas preservation where to give, get some extra oxygen to the, to the pancreas, you have uh, um, the UW below, you have uh, oxygenated perfluorocarbons as a layer on top, and pancreas is floating at the, at the interface, and it gets oxygen through the, uh, through, through the UW, um, through the, sorry, PFC. Uh, another uh, development is an oxygen carrier. This has been trialed in a, in a kidney study a few years ago, so where it's, it's it's a form of a slug found, uh, found in France, which has a uh, oxygen carrier, which, which can hold 150 molecules of oxygen as compared to four of hemoglobin. And uh, this has been shown to improve function. But again, none of these things have actually come into uh, st routine practice. Now, how can we improve organ preservation? I mean, for obviously, we to improve um, post graft transplant graft function, we need to reduce the uh, ischemic reposition related injury. We need to reduce the discard rate of organs. If you can use many more organs that we are able to transplant, then obviously the number of transplants can increase. And also you, can, you have to increase, the, expand the donor pool. So uh, you can't say 60-year-old donors, we cannot use their livers. You know, that's the only way we can increase the number of transplants that we can do. The problem with all this is it all has to be research-based. So you need evidence-based for this. And endpoints are very difficult to find in transplantation these days. If you take liver transplantation as an example, on an average, the perioperative survival is about 90 to 95%. So what are you going to do to improve preservation in such a way that you can actually show a statistical difference in to say that this method is better than the other methods? Right now, UW gives you a success of 90 to 95%. You need to have something which gives 98%. You need large numbers to show that actually there's a difference in the quality of preservation. And that's where actually um, this came in. Um, uh, useful. So this is again going back to where they were before the uh, brain stem death testing was done, using non-heart beating or, or DCD donors means donors for whom the uh, the brain test uh, stem death test can't be done because um, they they are not fully satisfied. But there's no chance of their surviving. In those patients, you withdraw support, you wait for the heart to stop, and then you take these organs, which by definition means they all have a period of warm ischemia between the ta time the heart stops and ischemia starts and the time the liver or the kidney is taken out and perfused and cooled. So if you look at the categories, um, so this is what is most interesting. You know, unsuccessful resuscitation. These are the patients who have had an arrest, the heart stops, you then take them to the theater, you open them up, cool them up. You're having a, a warm ischemia times of nearly 30 minutes in these patients. And these are the organs which 50% of the times they will not work. And these are the organs in whom you can show a better preservation if you use newer techniques. Um, so when, um, so my uh, uh, work in the UK, I worked with uh, uh, Professor David Talbot in Newcastle University. Um, so we, he was a big fan of uh, organ preservation, machine perfusion, uh, DC donation, and he, because it's a new, in, in the UK, research fund goes to Oxford, Cambridge, and London. Nothing ever comes to Newcastle. So he actually took this old uh, dialysis machine, which was lying around in the lab, and then used that as a perfusion pump to do work on kidney uh, preservation in pigs. And I think over the next three or four years, uh, two of his uh, fellows pumped about 300 to 400 kidneys and um, got a lot of publications, actually, looking at uh, how to improve category to donation. And we used to have uh, actually one of the three centers in Europe who had a category two a donation program. So you get a call from the casualty saying there's a cardiac arrest. The person on call goes in, he puts cannulas into the femoral artery uh, and femoral vein, starts cold perfusion in the emergency room itself, shifts into the theater, takes the kidneys out, puts them on the machine, and then perfuses them. 
see if they're viable, and then transplant them. And based on, the, on, on that work that we did, we came up with the criteria to say when you can transplant a kidney, when a single kidney won't be enough. So you need to put both the kidneys from a donor into one patient to have adequate kidney function. And the discard rate of, of these kidneys actually halved from 50% to just under 20%. Obviously, then the companies came in and very quickly, actually, kidney uh, uh, machine perfusion became, became the norm in the UK. By the time I left the UK in 2010, 2011, more than 50% of kidneys were being perfused on machines in, in the UK. And uh, almost all of non harboring kidneys were being perfused in, in the UK uh, on cold perfusion. And how does cold perfusion work? Uh, possible mechanisms are obviously, we talked about the microcirculation. The, the shutdown of the microcirculation is, is, pre is prevented because the fluid is continuously being perf perfused through the, through the uh, organ, so they all remain open. The metabolites, the toxic metabolites, some of them get cleared. Uh, the, the ambient oxygen that gets mixed up in the solution, that produces, provides some amount of oxygen which can maintain basal metabolism at least to prevent the pump failure. And it also helps in quality assessment. So based on the resistance to the flow of the, you know, on the machine, you know how good the vascular system is. And if the resistance is very low, then the kidney will work. If the resistance is very high, then the kidney is likely to fail. So that was actually used as a viability testing to decide whether to use these kidneys or not. Um, we, we looked at uh, using machine for other organs. The pancreas, it didn't work. It used to cause a lot of edema. Um, uh, so um, uh, it was even now pancreas, you get the occasional reports of pancreas preservation using machine perfusion, but there's no clinical uh, um, uh, role for it right now. Uh, livers were actually perfused. There was a surgeon in, in the US, uh, uh, Dr. Gurara, who was a big uh, uh, fan of liver machine perfusion. Um, but it was all without oxygen, and actually the results were never up to up to mark. The, res the results were not as good as in kidneys, because the liver needs a bit more than just pumping. Uh, the other way of looking at it is giving oxygen directly to the organs. So this is a technique called oxygen persiflation. This was actually what what my research was in the UK, where we used bubble oxygen, gaseous oxygen, into the organ through the venous system. The oxygen goes into the tissues and then comes out through small openings in the surface of the organ. And we showed that actually this oxygenates the, liver, the, the pancreas much better, the tissue ATP levels are better, the islet yields the, uh, of, of those pancreas that are preserved with oxygen preservation are actually much better than cold storage or machine perfusion. Uh, Professor Minor in Germany, he worked on, on the same technique in pigs and he showed that liver transplantation of, of uh, DCD livers Preserved with oxygen preservation actually gives much better results than without oxygen preservation. But all that changed when uh, the two things were combined. So you oxygenation and machine perfusion were combined to get what is called as HOPE. HOPE is hypothermic oxygen machine perfusion where you actually pump the organ, but you keep oxygenating the perfusion fluid. So you're delivering the oxygen at the same time, you are keeping the vascular system open at the same time, you are flushing out the metabolites at the same time. And uh, this initial, the initial studies done by uh, uh, Pierre Clavian, it showed that you know, um, livers uh, preserved with um, oxygen perf uh, machine perfusion do much better than uh, livers uh, preserved. So this is in the pig study. Uh, then there's been an uh, increasing research in, in clinical studies. So now there's been a randomized trial using uh, HOPE in liver transplantation, and it shows that in the, in the DCD patients, the chance of biliary strictures is much lower in patients who have uh, oxygenation uh, machine perfusion. Uh, this is a study from um, uh, uh, using standard brain dead donors, again showing that the survival of grafts is better in patients who have uh, the livers perfused, uh, preserved by oxygenated perfusion rather than just static cold storage. The next level is normothermic preservation. So this is, again, now this is going back to much, much earlier what uh, the early, very, very early uh, things, um, techniques. So here you're preserving the organ at normal temperature, 37 degrees, using blood or diluted blood with nutrients and oxygen added to it. And what you're hoping is that actually there's no shutdown of metabolism. Normal metabolic metabolism continues to go on. 
The organ, organ is getting oxygenated, the organ is getting nutrients, it's continuing to repair and regenerate itself. And you can actually do viability testing in a much better fashion here than in hypothalamic injury. So if you look at the liver, you can actually look at the bile production, how many ml of bile is the liver producing, and if you, you and you decide whether is this good enough to be transplanted. So, so normothenic machine perfusion, which is in the form of organ ox, again, this was the initial studies were done uh, in Oxford uh, by by one of our, uh, I, I think so, Dr. Sonal will know, uh, Dr. Srikant Reddy, he was a research fellow in Oxford with Peter Friend. He was working on uh, on pigs, pig livers, putting them on this, on this um, normothenic perfusion and seeing how they work. And uh, now that's become a big company now called Organox. So um, uh, these are the various benefits of normothenic perfusion. So it supplies oxygen, nutrients, allows regeneration, removes the waste, and it also can be used for assessment of viability. So this was the first randomized trial of normothenic preservation liver transplantation. This was published in, in Nature. Um, uh, and it showed that the amount of tissue injury in these livers was lesser as compared to standard preservation. And the discard rates of these livers were lesser as compared to standard preservation. Again, this was not, uh, there were a lot of uh, critics for this study because the end point of measuring AST and ALT to say uh, liver success is actually not a good thing because uh, that really doesn't affect uh, graft outcomes unless they are in the thousands. So here the difference was only 488 and 964. So um, it was actually uh, not uh, showing the, the kind of benefit that they hope that they will show. But there have been further studies after this. So this is a study from Birmingham uh, looking at uh, livers that have been discarded. So which means the, in the UK, the livers offered to multiple centers. Uh, if all the seven centers turn it down because of quality issues and there is a reason for it to, for it to be of poor quality, then these livers were taken by, by the Birmingham unit. They were put on organox, they were pumped, viability was assessed, and then they were transplanted. And these patients then were, uh, were compared to the standard liver transplant patients, patients who received organs which were accepted on the first round. And they showed that the outcome is similar. So these, these, transplant, these organs would never have been transplanted in the normal system. They would have been just chucked in the bin. But they actually transplanted 22 of the, of the 30 or so organs that they received uh, using viability testing, and, and they had an excellent success. And that again shows that you know, when in a, in, a, in a very good organ, all these preservation techniques might not make any difference compared to UW. But if it's a marginal organ, if an organ is of, of suspect quality, then these preservation techniques can help you improve the quality of the organ. It will also help you decide whether is this organ going to work in my patient or not, instead of finding it out after you transplant in the patient. So uh, normothenic preservation also has opened up a lot of research uh, avenues for uh, organ modification and, and modulation, graft modulation in the preservation period. So until now, it was just a matter of keeping it cold until it gets transplanted. Now it's not like that anymore. So because the organ is warm, you can actually do a lot of things to it. You can, you can, you can use defatting agents to, uh, to actually reduce the fat in these livers. So if you have a steatotic liver, the liver is fatty, you know it doesn't work as well. But if you defatten the liver, then the liver would work better. You can actually use uh, gene silencing techniques to actually block inf ischemic reperfusion injury. So you block the genes which, um, uh, which, which actually um, uh, lead to the progression of uh, ischemic reperfusion injury. You block them, and your outcomes can be better. So there's a, there's a lot of work right now uh, on how you can actually modify the graft so that it be functions better um, in the post-operative period. This is the latest thing. This is normothermic regional perfusion. So it's basically using um, uh, oxygenated uh, bypass uh, and ECMO in these donors. So these are the donors. So again, these are the DCD donors who had a cardiac arrest. You wait for five or 10 minutes, whatever your country's law says. You then put them on an ECMO machine and restart the circulation, start pumping the organs again. So now it is like a standard DBD donor where your heart is beating, so you can just do your warm face dissection, then you cross clamp, you do your cold And they've shown that in DCD donors, using NRP actually significantly improves your graft survival. So if you look at the, the situation right now in India, we're still using only cold storage. There was a period of time when Organox machine was brought in, but there's too much of issue with, in terms of cost and access. It's not just not financially viable in our country 
uh, to use these machines in, in, on a routine basis. But if you look at the UK, um, more than 50% of all DCD organs are being pumped now, and more than 20% of all DBD organs, so that is, even though it's a, it's a donation out of brain death, because the liver is fatty or because they got two transplants to do, so the cold is going to be longer, they're going to put in, they're putting them on a machine. And they, and they, they are seeing very good results. In fact, uh, they say that if you transplant a DCD liver pumped, it's almost like you're doing a living donor transplantation because it's, it's, there's no ischemic recursion injury at all. So that's the problem for us. In India, it's a question of cost. It's a question of access. Um, so Ognox came. It was there for almost a year and a half, um, but never picked up. Uh, now we have hope here in, uh, uh, in India. So they're also trying to uh, build a market. But again, the cost has to come down significantly before it can be accessible for our uh, population. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Universe. I mean, that was pretty comprehensive and uh, very exciting for the future, isn't it? Because yeah. now we're preserving organs for longer. And as uh, uh, Dr. Kumar just said, you know, you may reach a situation where you'll end up with sort of a central organ bank and allocation happening, uh, uh, you know, from sort of a uh, centralized facility. Uh, but for now, of course, we are static cold storage, cooling the organ down rapidly, flushing the blood out, using standard solutions is the way we do it. And uh, the solutions vary a little bit, but they are not largely different between different organs. So right now we uh, we have UW solution. We have what is called HTK. Um, I don't know if you have Marshall still available because they stopped is available. available. Okay. Uh, IGL is available as well. So. Hmm. IGL is there, and uh, I think that's it. IGL, UW, and HTK. So again, that last slide I took out, it's a recent publication by, P by Pierre Clavian. They have uh, stored livers for five days. Kidneys would be much longer. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a very uh, group in the US for kidneys that are being uh, re uh, rejected. And if they go on warm perfusion for 90 minutes, uh, majority of them give you turnaround with very good outcomes. So there is a merit of warm perfusion, certainly for marginal extended criteria organs. For the liver and kidney, and particularly for the liver in the DCD context, because of their high risk of biliary problems if the ischemic time is too high. Um, but for livers and kidneys, certainly for other organs, standard organs, then the cold per oxygenated cold perfusion seems to buy them sufficient time. And what was said was absolutely right, because to try and gain even 5% improvement, given the success, uh, you'd need to have to do thousands and thousands of transplants to get that. So that's going to be a long way off. And it's better to go for the uh, top of the iceberg, which is to look at the really, really crazy DCD, uh, really extended criteria ones, find benefit there, and progress it, progress it down to the base of the pyramid. I mean, uh, yeah, one point here is that our indications differ a little bit from if, uh, the what's been reported in the West. Our commonest reasons for marginal organs are poor donor preservation and bad logistics. Okay, So this is something that we face on a regular basis. And in fact, the organs that we put on the machines predominantly come from donors that have had hypotension or have generally not been well managed for a while. So uh, we have to obviously look, look at things in context. Uh, I, I mean, the other place where it's uh, marginal, or the machines can actually be used to modify organ characteristics as well. Uh, like, for example, now there's a lot of work in defattening livers. If you put it and you put in certain med uh, medication to sort of maybe reduce the amount of fat. We've used uh, a liver from a septic donor where we actually used circulated antibiotics for a little while. I don't know how helpful it was, but the, do the recipient did okay. So, and in the lung situation, you had a yeah. situation where you can dry lungs out, you know, Correct. with so that. A beyond just, so it's beyond resuscitating poorly managed donor lungs or organs in general. So what Lydia was saying earlier, we get very little time because of the, uh, the, the time span uh, dictated by the family. So even more reason to try and bring in the machines to res resuscitate poorly managed organs 
um, rep and then you can repair. So for hearts and lungs, but certainly for hearts, you could do bypass, you repair a valve, and I'm sure you guys could do the same thing. Um, and But most excitingly is what you can now start doing for the future survivorship of the recipient and the organ, <laughs> because several things are happening. One is you can do genetic manipulation. So with CRISPR-Cas based technology now, if you can perfuse for a sufficient time, we might be able to get immunological tolerance, or at least the ability to give far less immunosuppression. And then you've got uh, organ regeneration, either de novo from stem cells, or we heard earlier, decellularization organs to be reseeded <laughs> So the two different constructs, which are going to need in that fragile early stage some uh, time in a machine supported until it grows strong enough to be then implanted. So it's a very exciting field, and uh, clearly you've got to be in it. And uh, I can't see why, with all the technology and you guys putting a sp space probe to Mars, why these things can't be done cheaply in India. They will be. Okay. Uh, uh, any, any questions about this at all? Because this is actually a very important part. So we've talked about, you know, uh, I mean, we've kind of had a fairly sort of passive group so far. We kind of do need a little bit of action here. You know, so please ask some questions, you know, because, um, I mean, we talked about how you identify patients. You talked about how patients are referred to you, what kind of consent process, the papers that you need to see. When you retrieve an organ, how the organs are to be stored and how they, they are supposed to be transported. Uh, I mean, th this is also there in the handout right now. But so far, are we clear, or do we have any questions? OK, great. So we'll move to the next part, which is coffee. which is uh, <laughs> And uh, after that, we actually have the webcast of all the organ retrievals. And uh, this is done in a slightly different way. We have you know eminent leaders who will be demonstrating the process of organ retrieval, heart, lung, liver, and kidney. Uh, they'll talk us through the operation. And here, uh, Dr. Anand and myself will be asking some questions. This is uh, traditionally a sort of the most popular part of uh, this workshop because this is webcast live, and we do get a lot of interaction from colleagues across the world. Uh, so please use this opportunity to you know to ask questions as well. Johnny outside.